So that might change completely. It's like everything that's said converted to text might change completely the dynamics of what we do in this world, especially now with remote work, right? Exactly, exactly. With, with Zoom and so on, that's, that's fascinating to think about. I mean, for me, I care about podcasts, right? And one of the things that was, you know, I'm torn. I know a lot of the engineers at Spotify, so I, I love them very much because they, uh, they dream big in terms of like, they wanna empower creators. So one of my hopes was with Spotify that they would use a technology like Rev or something like that to to start converting everything into uh, into text and make it indexable. Like one of the things that's, that sucks with podcasts is like, it's hard to find stuff. Like the, the model is basically subscription. Like you find, uh, it's similar you used, it's similar to what YouTube used to be like, which is you basically find a creator that you enjoy and you subscribe to them and like you just yeah uh, you, you just kind of follow what they're doing, but the search and discovery wasn't a big part of YouTube like in the early days, but and that's what currently with podcasts like is the search and discovery is uh, like non-existent. You're basically searching for like the dumbest possible thing, which is like keywords in the right. titles of episodes. Yeah, As but a, even aside from searching this cover, like all the time, so I listen to like a number of podcasts and um, you know, there's something said and I wanna like go back to that later because I was trying to, I'm trying to remember, true. what do you say? Like maybe like recommended some cool product that yeah. I wanna try out and like it's basically impossible. Maybe like some people have pretty good show notes, so maybe you'll get lucky and you can find it, right? But I mean, if everyone had transcripts and it was all searchable. It was a game changer. It'd be so much better. I mean, that's one of the things that I, I wanted to, I mean, one of the reasons we're talking today is I wanted to take this quite seriously, the, the rough thing. I've just been lazy. Uh, so uh, because I'm very fortunate that a lot of people support this podcast, that there's enough money now to do uh, transcription and so on, it, it seemed clear to me, especially like CEOs and sort of uh, like PhDs, like people write to me who are like graduate students in computer science or graduate students in whatever the heck field. It's clear that their mind, like they enjoy podcasts when they're doing laundry or whatever, but they wanna revisit the conversation in a much more rigorous way. And they mm -hmm. really want a transcript. Mm -hmm. Like it's clear that they want to like analyze conversations. like. So many people wrote to me about a transcript for Yosha Bach conversation. I had just a bunch of conversations. And then on the Elon Musk side, like reporters want like, they want to write a blog post about your conversation. So they want to be able to pull stuff. And it's like, they're essentially doing on your conversation transcription privately. They're doing it for, yeah. for themselves and yeah. then starting to pick, but it's so much easier when you can actually do it as a reporter, just look at the transcript. Yeah, and you can like embed a little thing, you know, like into your article, right? Here's what they yeah. said. Here you can go listen to like this clip from the section. I'm actually trying to, trying to figure out, I'll probably on the website create like a place where the transcript goes like as a web page, so that people can reference it, like reporters can reference it and so on. I mean, most of the reporters probably have, uh, want to write clickbait articles that are complete falsifying, the, which I'm fine with. It's the way of journalism, I don't care. Like I've had this conversation with um, a, a friend of mine, a mixed martial artist, the Ryan Hall. <laughs> and we, we talked about, you know, as I've been reading The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich and a bunch of books on Hitler. And we brought up Hitler and he made some kind of comment where like, we should be able to forgive Hitler. And, uh, you know, like we were talking about forgiveness and we we're bringing that up as like the worst case possible thing is like even, you know, for people who are Holocaust survivors, one of the ways to let go of the suffering they've been through is to is to forgive. And he brought up like Hitler as somebody that would, would potentially be the, the hardest thing to possibly forgive, but it might be a worthwhile pursuit psychologically, mm -hmm. so on, blah, 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 it doesn't matter. It was very eloquent, very powerful words. I think people should go back and listen right, to right. it. It's powerful. And then all these journalists, there's yeah. all these articles written about like, MMA fight, UFC fight, MMA right? Fighter lost Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, well, no, they didn't. They were somewhat accurate. Uh -huh. he, they didn't say like loves Hitler. They said um, 
thinks that uh, if Hitler came back to life, we should forgive him. Like they kind of, it's kind of accurate ish, but it, it, the headline made it sound a lot worse than, than, uh, than it was, but I'm fine with it. That's the way the, that's the way the world, I want to, I want to almost make it easier for those journalists and make it easier for people who actually care about the conversation to go and look and see. Right. They can see it for themselves. For themselves. There's the headline, but they can go. There's something about podcasts, like the audio that makes it difficult to, to go, to jump to a spot and to look for that. For, for that particular information. I think some of it, you know, I'm interested in creating like myself experimenting with stuff. So like they, t- taking Rev and creating a transcript and then people can go to it. I do dream that like, I'm not in the loop anymore that like, you know, Spotify does it, right? Like yeah. uh, the, automatically for everybody because ultimately that, one click purchase needs to be there like you I mean, know like you kind of want support from the entire ecosystem right? exactly like from the tool makers and the podcast creators even clients right i mean imagine if like uh, most podcast apps you know if, if it was a standard right here's how you include a transcript into mm-hmm. a podcast right like it's just an rss feed ultimately mm-hmm. um, and actually uh, just yesterday i saw this company called buzzsprout i think they're, they're yep. called uh so so they're trying to do this, they uh, proposed a spec, um, an extension to their uh, RSS format to reference podcast, uh, reference transcripts in a standard way. Yeah. And they're talking about like, there's one uh, client that I mentioned that will support it, but imagine like more clients support it, right? So any podcast you could go um, and see the transcripts right in your like normal podcast app. Yeah, I mean, somebody, so I have somebody who works with me uh, is works with helps with advertise uh, with advertising. Uh, Matt is an awesome guy. He mentioned Buzzsprout to me, but he says it's really annoying because they want exclusive. Uh, they want to host the podcast. Right. This is the problem with Spotify too. Uh, this is where I'd like to say, like, f Spotify. There's a magic to RSS with podcasts. Is it can be made available to everyone, and then there's all there's this ecosystem of different podcast players that emerge and they compete freely right. and that that's a that's a beautiful thing that that's why i go on exclusive like joe rogan went exclusive um i'm not sure if you're familiar with he went to just, just spotify is a huge of joe, a fan of joe rogan i've been kind of nervous about the whole thing but let's see let's i hope that spotify steps up they've added video which was very surprising that they were so, so able exclusive to meaning up. you can't subscribe to his RSS feed anymore. It's no. only in Spotify. For now, you can until December 1st. And December uh-huh. 1st, it all everything disappears and it's Spotify only. I uh, you know, and, and Spotify gave him a hundred million dollars for that. Yeah, so it's funny. it's uh it's an interesting deal. But I I you know I did some soul searching and I'm glad he's doing it. But if Spotify came to me with a hundred million dollars, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do, well, I, I have a very different relationship with money. I hate money, but I just think I believe in the pirate radio aspect of podcasting, the freedom, yeah. and that there's something- The open about, source spirit. The open source spirit, it just doesn't seem right. It doesn't feel right. That said, you know, because so many people care about Joe Rogan's program, they're gonna hold Spotify's feet to the fire. Like one of the cool things what, what, what Joe told me is the reason he likes working with Spotify is that they they're like ride or die together, right? So they they want him to succeed. So that's why they're not actually telling him what to do, despite what people think. They they don't tell him they don't give him any notes on anything. They want him to succeed. And that's the cool thing about exclusivity with a platform is like you're kind of want each other to succeed. And that process can actually be very fruitful. Like YouTube, it goes back to my criticism. YouTube generally, no matter how big the creator, I mean, maybe for PewDiePie, something like that, they want you to succeed. But for the most part, from all the big creators I've spoken with, Veritasium, all those folks, you know, they get some basic assistance, but it's not like, YouTube doesn't care if you succeed or not. They have so they have, many creators. They have like a hundred other. 
they, they don't yeah. care. So, and especially with um, with somebody like Joe Rogan, who YouTube sees Joe Rogan not as a person who might revolutionize the nature of news and idea space and nuanced conversations. They see him as a potential person who uh, who uh, has racist guests on, or like, you know, they, they see him as like a headache potentially. So, you know, a lot of people talk talk about this. It's it's a hard place to be for YouTube actually, is figuring out with the search and discovery process of how do you filter out conspiracy theories and which conspiracy theories represent dangerous untruths and which conspiracy theories are like vanilla untruths. And then even when you have start having meetings and discussions about what is true or not, it yeah. starts getting weird. Yeah, it starts it's, getting it's weird. difficult these days, right? I worry more about the other side, right? Of too much, you know, too much not censorship. censorship. Well, maybe censorship is the right word. I mean, uh, censorship is usually government censorship, but still, uh, yeah, putting yourself in a position of arbiter for these kinds of things, it's yes. very difficult. And people think it's so easy, right? Like, it's like, well, you know, like no Nazis, right? What a simple principle. Uh, but, you know, yes, I mean, no one likes Nazis. Yeah. But there's like many shades of gray, yeah. like very soon after that. Yeah. And, and then, you know, of course, everybody, you know, there's some people that call our current president a Nazi. And then there's like, so you start getting uh, a Sam Harris. I don't know if you know that is <laughs> wasted, I, in my opinion, his conversation with Jack Dorsey. And I, I'll also, I spoke with Jack before on this podcast and we'll talk again. But <laughs> Sam brought up, uh, Sam Harris does not like Donald Trump. <laughs> I, I, I do listen to his podcast, so I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with his views on the matter. <laughs> <laughs> and he uh, he asked Jack Dorsey, he's like, how can you not ban Donald Trump from Twitter? And so, you know, there's a set, you have that conversation. You have a conversation where some number, some significant number of people think that the current president of the United States should not be on your platform. And it's like, okay, so if that's even on the table as a conversation, then everything's on the table for conversation. And yeah, it's it's tough. I'm not sure where I land on it. I, I'm with you. I think that censorship is bad, but I also think the show. Ultimately, be I just also think, you know, if you're the kind of person that's going to be convinced, you know, by some YouTube video, you know, that I don't know our government's been taken over by aliens, it's unlikely that, like, you know, you'll be returned to sanity simply because, you know, that video is not available on, on, on YouTube, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm with you. I tend to believe in the intelligence of people and we should we should trust them. But I also do think it's a responsibility of platforms to encourage more love in the world, more kindness to each other. And I don't always think that they're great at doing that particular thing. So that... that um, there's a nice balance there. And I think philosophically, I think about that a lot. Where's the balance between free speech and like encouraging people, even though they have the freedom of speech to not be an asshole. Yeah, right. Like, that's not a constitutional like, uh, so you have the right for, to, for free speech, but like, just don't be an asshole. Like, you can't really put that in the Constitution. The Supreme Court can't be like, eh, just don't be a dick. But I feel like platforms have a role to be like, just be nicer. Maybe do the carrot, like encourage people to be nicer as opposed to the stake of censorship. But I think it's, it's an interesting machine learning problem. Just be nicer. Hmm. Uh, machine, yeah, machine learning for niceness. <laughs> it is, I mean. Responsible AI, I mean, it is. it is a thing. Um, for sure. Jack Dorsey kind of talks about it as a vision for Twitter is how do we increase the health of conversations? I don't know how seriously they're actually trying to do that though, uh, which is one of the reasons I am in part considering uh, entering that space a little it's bit. It's difficult for them, right? Because you know it's kind of like well known that, you know, people are kind of driven by, you know, rage and, you know, uh, outrage maybe is a better word, right? Outrage drives engagement, and well, they, these companies are judged by engagement, right? So it's, in the short it, term, but this goes to the metrics thing that we were yeah. talking about earlier. I do believe I have a fundamental belief that 
if you have a metric of long-term happiness of your users, like not short-term engagement, but long-term happiness and growth and both like intellectual, emotional health of your users, you're going to make a lot more money. You're going to have long, like you should be able to optimize for that. You don't need to uh, necessarily optimize for engagement. Yeah. And that'll be good for society too. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I, I generally agree with you, but it requires a patient person with, you know, trust from Wall Street to, to, to be able to carry out such a strategy. This is the this is what I believe the Steve Jobs character and Elon Musk character is like, you basically have to be so good at your job. Right, you gotta pass you, for anything. That you can hold the board and every all the investors hostage by saying like, either we do it my way or I leave. And everyone is too afraid of you to leave because right. they believe in your vision. So that, but that requires being really good at, uh, yeah. really good at what you do. It requires being Steve Jobs and Elon Musk. And the, there's, yeah. there's kind of a reason why like a third name doesn't come immediately to mind, right? Like there is maybe a handful of other people, but it's, it's not that many. It's not many. I mean, people say like, why are you, like people say that I'm like a fan of Elon Musk. I'm not, I'm a fan of anybody who's like Steve Jobs and Elon Musk. And there's just not many of those folks. It's the guy that made us believe that like we can get to Mars, yeah. you know, in 10 years, right? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of awesome. And, and it's kind of making it happen, which is like, <laughs> it's it's great. You it's know, kind of it, gone like that kind of like spirit, right? Like from a lot of our society, right? You know, like we can get to the moon in 10 years and like we did it, right? Yeah, especially in this time of uh, so much kind of existential dread that people are going through because of COVID, right. like having rockets that just keep going out there now with humans. I don't know that uh, it, just like you said, I mean, it, it gives you a reason to wake up in the morning and, and dream mm -hmm. for us engineers too. Uh, it uh, is inspiring as hell, man.